Hello, my excellent, excellent biologist. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the cell membrane. And in this part one, we're gonna talk about the structures and how that relates to the function of the cell membrane. In part two, we'll talk a little bit more about diffusion and osmosis and water potential, all right? So let me make myself a little bit smaller. And while I'm doing that, let me remind you that down um, in the video descriptor, you you will see notes um, that I use with my students. Those are two column notes. The first column is the scaffolding of the notes and you can fill in wherever there's yellow highlighted portions. That's what I'm going over with my students. And then the second column, you need to embed pictures and images that help you in your understanding of membrane structure and function. All right, so first of all, here you can see a eukaryotic cell. And if you've been with me this year so far, you know we have already differentiated between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And what I did with the marker is I just went around the outside and I identified the cell membrane. Remember, a critical part of understanding a cell is that it needs to have a large surface area per volume. Prokaryotic cells are smaller, so that enables them to have a larger ratio. Eukaryotic cells are larger. And so one way to overcome that is all the compartmentalization and the additional membranes within the cell. So don't limit when we talk about membranes, try not to just think about that outer cell membrane, but remember that there are membranes throughout a eukaryotic cell and they all play very important roles, things like increasing surface area, increasing surface area and having a barrier from one side to another that you could have a chemiosmotic gradient across that you could use to make ATP. There's so much there, all right? So we'll start by just looking at the simplest picture of a cell membrane. Okay, so you can see the phospholipid bilayer. We can, we've already talked about this pretty extensively, but these fatty acids are hydrophobic. They are long carbon hydrocarbons, right? Carbons and hydrogens, sharing fare for the most part. And so they're at the center of the membrane. And then on either edge, right, of the membrane, you have these hydrophilic phosphate groups, either facing the watery interior inside or the exterior fluid that the cell is sitting in. A second item you can see here are these large proteins. Now remember, proteins, we talk about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. The primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is the alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. The tertiary structure is the folding pattern imposed upon the secondary structure due to the R groups. And the quaternary structure is more than one chain. So when you just see this big orange blob, keep in mind that is made out of amino acids folded in a very specific way in order for them to do their function. This particular protein is a transmembrane, meaning it goes from one side all the way to the other side. Some proteins are only found on one edge, and those would be peripheral proteins. Something else we can see when we look at this cell membrane is this right here, these purple strings. That is part of the cytoskeleton. An example of that would be like actin, and those are basically two chains, of, two chains of amino acids twisted together, providing the underlying kind of girder or support of this cell membrane. This particular cell membrane we can tell is probably in an animal cell because I do not see a cell wall on the outside. Okay, so on your um, notes, take a look at your notes, and we're at phospholipids, and one of the first things I want you to notice about these phospholipids that they, is that they are amphipathic, which means they have an area of them that is hydrophobic, nonpolar, and then an area of them that are that is hydrophilic. So it has different properties on either end. So let's zoom in, okay? When we zoom in right here, we can see the polar head, right? And then we can see these long fatty acid chains. These are the parts that are hydrophobic. So amphipathic is a molecule, molecule having both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. Now, a phospholipid is just a modification of, right? We have, we have lipids and we have two categories of lipids. We have fats and steroids. So fats are typically glycerol with three long fatty acid chains. One of those fatty acid chains has been replaced by a phosphate group. The other type of lipid is a steroid. And look right here, we have cholesterol, right? So cholesterol, remember we talked about all, um, 
um, steroids have four rings of carbon. We also talked about how cholesterol is the precursor to our steroid hormones like testosterone and progesterone. Both of them are within the cell membrane. So the phospholipid bilayer, it kind of creates the barrier, but we're gonna see the important role of cholesterol as well. You can see there's a kink in this fatty acid chain, right? And we know that's because there's a double bond in the carbon-carbon interaction right there, which causes that kink in the chain. Remember we talked about saturated and unsaturated. One of the roles that cholesterol plays is to fill in the gaps of those spaces to keep the cell membrane intact. Keep in mind that your cell membrane has the consistency of like a nice olive oil, right? And so you kind of need to hold that phospholipid bilayer together and cholesterol can do that by filling in the gaps. Another thing it can do is when you have more saturated fatty acid chains is it can create the space in order to maintain the fluidity of the cell membrane and the flexibility of the cell membrane. So on your notes, we have, I'm, I'm in the notes, which you can access down in the descriptor, right? Phospholipids, amphipathic molecules, having both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, and then the heads, right? The blue part, let me get a marker here. Let me get a maca. Okay, this part right here, that's the head, right? Is hydrophilic and it's pointed outward to the aqueous medium or because it's a bilayer, right? Remember, so let me go back here. It's either pointed outward or it's pointed inward, right? Those hydrophilic region. And then the tails are hydrophobic and they are pointed to the interior of the cell membrane. Cholesterol is found just in animal cells, not in plant cells, right? We don't have to worry so much about that cell membrane and maintaining it when you have a cell wall around the outside. But animal cells, we don't have that. So cholesterol in animal cells helps modify the fluidity of the membrane over a whole range of temperatures. If it's too hot, it prevents it from becoming too fluid and just breaking apart. And if it's too cold, then it prevents it from freezing. All right, and then proteins are what, what we looked at right here. Let me go back, these proteins right here are what make membranes different and determine their functions and determine their functions. And we're gonna go into more detail about that. But underneath, I have integral means it's completely embedded. So like this transmembrane protein is integral throughout it. Um, it spans the cell membrane. Okay, and we're gonna see examples of that when they're channels and carriers. If it's peripheral, it's just on one side or the other, okay, on one side of the membrane. And we're gonna talk about the G protein. Just put a pen in that, we'll come back to that later. So they have multiple functions and we'll be going over all of those functions. Let's take a look at another picture here, okay? Can you find all four important organic molecules in the cell membrane? Are all four represented here? I'm asking, I'm asking probably an egg puzzle. Okay, Are, can you see one, two, three, and four? Hopefully you said no, but you can see three of the four important organic molecules when you study this picture. So let's think back. So we know, right, about the first important organic molecule that we studied were carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are built out of sugars. And if you look right here, these are a series of sugars connected together. The yellow are carbohydrate side chains, okay? And you can see that structure, right, of a simple sugar. They are called glycolipids if they are attached to a phospholipid, okay? So this would be considered a glycolipid, but if they're attached to a protein, they are called a glycoprotein, all right? And that has a lot to do with cell recognition, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, okay? So carbohydrates, check, those are represented. The second um, important organic molecule that we discussed were lipids, and there were two categories of lipids, fats and steroids. Both of those are represented because this is a modification of a fat, this is a phospholipid, and then cholesterol is a steroid. So that's number two. Okay, the third important organic molecule we talked about were proteins. Proteins are, the building block of all proteins are amino acids. So here we can see several different proteins within this membrane. The only one we don't see of the four important 
are nucleic acids. So DNA and RNA are not found in cell membranes. But this is why when we learned atoms build molecules, molecules organelles, and organelles cells, we understand three of the four important organic molecules play a critical role in the function of a cell membrane. So on your notes, I am on uh, number three, letter C, um, underneath proteins, I said multiple functions for proteins, transport, recognition, enzymatic, communication, and connections. And we'll delve more into those a little bit later. Okay, next, Okay, next, let's talk about these glycolipids and glycoproteins. They will become part of what's called the ECM or the extracellular matrix outside of the cell. So on your notes, you can see ECM is in animal cells only because what you would have outside of that cell membrane would be a cell wall, like if you're talking about bacteria or plants or fungi, but in animals, um, you have these carbohydrate side chains. I'm going to just make a note. There is what's called the glycocalyx, which is on the very, very outside of bacterial cell walls. This is different. Okay. This is different. This is just outside of the cell membrane. And so they, uh, the extracellular matrix has these carbohydrate side chains, but you can have additional proteins in them as well. And we're going to touch, uh, touch into that a little bit more at the very end of part two. But for right now, what I would like you to know is it contains protein fibers and the glycocalyx and the glycocalyx are the carbohydrate side chains. The function of the ECM is support and communication support and communication and it may anchor some proteins and it may anchor some proteins some external proteins can be held to the surface right and we'll touch on that at the end so the conclusions i want to reach when we have our introduction here on cell membranes is that the cell membrane is asymmetrical which means it's not the same like a face is you know, symmetrical, you have eyes on both sides, right? Ears on both sides. But when you look on either side of the cell membrane, it is asymmetrical because to the exterior, exterior, you have the, the glycocalyx, those carbohydrate side chains, but to the interior, you have the cytoskeleton. So on your notes, you have to the inside cytoskeleton that may anchor some proteins on the interior to the outside, you have the ECM. Okay, and then emergent properties. We're gonna revisit that again. The whole is greater than the sum of its part. When it's working together, all of these pieces together, it's responsible for, and this is in your notes, the dynamic homeostasis, the dynamic homeostasis between the cell's external and internal environment. So it's responsible for the dynamic homeostasis between the external and the internal environment of the cell, all right? And then the cell membrane is described in this way. It's the fluid mosaic model. You know how we use models to represent. This is the fluid mosaic. The fluid part is how flexible those phospholipids are. The mosaic part are the scattering of those proteins amongst those phospholipids. So on your notes, and here I think I have a picture for you. Take a look right here. Okay. Let me go up here and get out of the way a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So here you can see the definition. Okay. But um, the fluid is the phospholipid bilayer and it has the consistency of olive oil. Okay consistency of olive oil. And then the mosaic is the scattered proteins. So when we look at this picture, okay, so the orange right here are the phospholipids. You can see the yellow cholesterol portions. You can see these blue, this is a transmembrane. It's integral. It's going on either side, whereas this one is a peripheral protein. And in the next little bit here, we're going to talk about all the different functions, but you can see right over here, that this one right here is a channel. It allows things to pass through it. And I wanna put this in your hair, head already, right? We know about lipids, right? Lipids are hydro what? Philic or are they hydrophobic? They're hydrophobic, right? These fatty acid chains. So something that is charged would have a hard time getting from one side of this membrane to the other side of the membrane. And so one of the roles is that proteins can act as channels or carriers to bring things across the cell membrane. And we'll be looking at that.
Okay, the other portion, um, let's see, I um, go to glycoproteins and glycolipids here on the outside. Remember, glycoproteins are carbohydrate side chains attached to proteins, and glycolipids are connected, like right here, the green ones, to the, to the phospholipids. So um, on your notes, carbohydrate side chains attached to either a protein or a lipid, and this is the cellular fingerprint, right? If your fingerprint is your identifier, it tells you who you are. So cells can talk to each other in one of two ways, right? They can either send a chemical signal, which is received by a receptor, either on the surface of the cell or to the interior of the cell, or one cell can come in contact with another cell. And that's where you read that fingerprint, right, to identify. When cells are developing, okay, when you're an embryo and you're developing and scales are, cells are migrating throughout the body, they can say, oh, you're a pancreatic cell, I'm a pancreatic cell, we ought to be together, right? They can self-identify using those carbohydrate side chains specifically, okay? Um, if you go underneath functions, cell to cell, for adhesion, adhesion, attaching, and recognition, I know who you are, those are particular to glycolipids, okay, the green ones right here, for adhesion and to know one another, right, cellular ID are glycolipids, for reception, for signaling, those are glycoproteins. So reception of signaling molecules, those are primarily the glycoproteins. And it's as, uh, we'll go into more detail about that later. Okay, so the next part I wanna transition into is going to be the functions of different proteins. Okay, oh, I take that back. I have a little chart here for you where we're gonna compare glycolipids with glycoproteins. Okay, so this just kind of differentiates. It's a little bit more detail than what you need on this one. Just the big point part I want you to see here is when that carbohydrate is attached to a lipid, it's a glycolipid versus a glycoprotein is where the carbohydrate side chain. And then just look at their functions, right? Very diverse on glycoproteins and they serve as receptors for chemical signals, whereas glycolipids are more about cell to cell recognition. And I skipped over something I wanted to point out to you from our previous unit. Look right here. Here's a protein and look right here alpha helix protein. Notice this one in that, what structure is that? When we looked at the helical nature, do you remember? Hopefully you said secondary structure. Remember we talked about an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So I just wanted to show you that as a reminder of what you had learned before. Okay, next let's focus on um, protein function. So once again, just another model, and I want you to see what you can recognize, right? Look for the phospholipids, right? Did you see the yellow here? Look for the proteins are in purple, okay? Look at the cholesterol right here, which is talking about the fluidity of the membrane, either preventing it from going apart, all kind of breaking apart in hot conditions or freezing in cold conditions. Right, we can see these different proteins, some are on the surface, some go all the way across, okay? You can see the carbohydrate side chains attached right here. This would be called a glycoprotein, right? As it's attached like that. So we're gonna go through several different, if you look at your notes, the functions of proteins, all right? So the first function we wanna talk about is a channel protein. So a channel protein, remember, the interior of the cell membrane is hydrophobic. So anything, even if it's tiny and very, very small, it would have a hard time crossing this phospholipid bilayer if it has a charge on it because it would be repelled. Remember, your cell membrane is to act as a barrier. So what's happening on one side of the membrane is, is different than what's happening on the other side. So what a channel does is it allows an ion like chloride to cross from one side to another. Now, I wanna make sure scale and proportion is made here. Remember, chloride is just a single atom and they're making it really huge in this picture, right? Because this orange is made out of amino acids and you know what amino acids are. So this is not the right proportion, but they just want you to see this channel and these channels as all proteins are, are super, super, super specific. So only chloride is allowed to use this particular channel to cross from one side to another. 
Now, some of you I know have heard of the genetic disease of cystic fibrosis, an inherited disorder. And cystic fibrosis causes a clogging of multiple organs in, in, in a human body, but one that you see is when it affects the lungs. And that clogging of the lungs makes it very difficult to breathe as the mucus accumulates. And so uh, a child, and notice I say child because there's a life expectancy into the maybe at the best now early 30s if you have cystic fibrosis before it overcomes your body, is that parents literally will pound on the back of the child to loosen up the mucus so that that can facilitate the breathing or they wear a vest which does that for them. And that is all because of just one type of protein not being in the right shape to allow chloride ions to move freely across it. And I have a picture here. You can see this little girl, right? She's wearing, um, she needs additional a mass so she can breathe and she's wearing a percussion vest to help break up the mucus. And it impacts, oops, sorry, I skipped one. Here we go. It impacts, let me make myself smaller, okay? Not just the lungs, but the sinuses and the skin and the liver and the pancreas and the intestines and your reproductive organs from just one type of protein not being in the right shape and therefore not being able to do its job, okay? So look down at your notes. Channel proteins allows a particular molecule to cross freely. And then I gave you the example of cystic fibrosis being a faulty chloride ion channels. Okay. So that's one is channel. Okay. The second function we want to look at are carriers. So we have channels. Now we have carriers. Carriers, it's not just where it passes freely through. It literally binds temporarily with that substance. Like if you were going to carry someone, you would bind with them, right? Temporarily. And so one of the carriers we're going to talk about in more depth is what's called the sodium potassium pump. Now, the sodium potassium pump is critical. When we think about the powerhouse of the cell, and you're going to tell me that's the mitochondria, right? The powerhouse of the cell, its job is to generate ATP. Of all the ATP you make in your body, 30% of it, okay, probably goes to just making your sodium potassium pumps work. And that's because sodium potassium pumps working is what makes your nerves work, your neurons that build your nerves. And what it does is it, the sodium potassium pump costs energy, right? So 30% of all the energy you make is for your cell membrane sodium potassium pumps. And it pumps sodium to the outside, okay? That's Na and potassium K to the inside, okay? Three sodiums out, two potassiums in. This pump redistributes those ions unequally. It concentrates sodium to the outside and it concentrates potassium to the inside. And this gives potential energy in order to make neurons fire, which I will teach you later, okay? But what I want you to know right now is it's very specific where it binds to the sodium on the protein and where it binds to the potassium. And that is a pump that is active transport. It costs you energy to do it, but you can do so much more with that. So that is your key example of a carrier um, protein. And it is believed that people who have a struggle with their sodium potassium pumps, that that could lead to one issue and that would be obesity, okay? Could be problems with their sodium potassium pump, okay? Now, you can see in this picture, this first picture, number one, you can see three sodium ions or specific places on the protein, right? Structure is critical for proteins. Where those three sodiums bind, notice ATP, that's the cheta, that's the energy currency of the cell binds. And then what you can see here is that the protein is literally changing its configuration, its allosteric shape, right? It's changing as the sodium binds. And when it flips to the other side, then it can put the sodium on the outside right here, which now makes the potassium binding sites available. So they bind. And then I know my bar right there is getting in the way. So then it changes shape again, releasing the potassium um, on the other side of the cell membrane. And this repeats, repeats. It costs you ATP. Okay. And that sets up 
all of our neuron and our signaling. So um, on your notes for carrier protein, selectively interact with a specific molecule so it can cross the membrane. And that is a possible cause, like I said, of obesity. Okay, so we have, we have channels, carriers, our next one is cell recognition. Yes, I have a little song and dance for that. Okay, so cell recognition. So right here, you're looking at a protein and you're looking at this phospholipid that's attached to it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say phospholipid. Um, the carbohydrate side chain that is attached to this particular protein and this protein is embedded in the phospholipids. When we talk about our immune system, Okay, when we talk about our immune system, there's something called the major histocompatibility complex. And remember when I talked about the fingerprints, right? And being able to recognize. Now, one of the key things that keeps us alive is being able to recognize other cells as friend or foe. Are you a part of me? Are you self? Are you non-self? Because anything that's in your body, a cell, that is not you, if it's not a Winnie Sloan cell, then chances are I wanna attack it and destroy it because it could make me sick. So part of our immune system is being able to recognize self from non-self and these glycolipids, the ones attached to the lipids, and in some case glycoproteins, right, are gonna enable you to do that. So on your group shared notes where it says cell recognition protein, glycoproteins are part of the MHC, major histocompatibility complex, which we will talk about when we learn the immune system. And it's how a cell recognizes self from non-self, okay? Self from non-self, so something that is foreign, that's when you're going to use these. And this can be a real problem, okay? If you think about, there are times when you do want a foreign cell in your body, and that might be if you're having an organ transplant, right? If you need a kidney, or you need pieces of a liver or something like that, when you get that organ put in you, your body's gonna go, wait a minute, you know, yeah, you're a kidney, right? But you don't belong to me. And so you start attacking that kidney. And that's when um, you talk about an organ being rejected, it's because your own immune system is attacking that. And so one way to prevent that rejection is to suppress your immune system, to suppress its ability to recognize something as foreign, but that makes you more susceptible to getting some other infection or disease when you're trying to keep out other things, right, from your body. Okay, so first function, channel. Second one is carrier. The third one is cell recognition, okay? The next one is a receptor. Okay, so here you can see a protein acting as a receptor. This molecule will bind right here. Remember, proteins are very, very specific. Now, you can have receptors that are on the edge of the cell membrane or to the interior of the cell, okay? But either way, that molecule is binding to that protein. If the protein is in the wrong shape, Okay, then it can't bind to it. Remember, two ways to communicate cell to cell. You either send a signal, which is what you're seeing in this, can, this situation right here, or cell to cell binding. Now, they believe that some forms of dwarfism is not because you're not producing the growth hormone, which this could be, let's say, a growth hormone. You're producing plenty of it, but your receptors are in the wrong shape, so they can't bind to it. So it's like you're yelling, growth hormone, growth hormone, you're sending it, but your cells are saying, na, 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 and they're not listening to it. And as a result, um, you're not growing. Now, there are different forms of dwarfism, but one of those is because you have problems with the receptors. These are not children. These are adults, right? But their arms and their legs are smaller proportionally to their head and their torso because they're having trouble with their receptor proteins. So on receptor proteins, shape so that a specific molecule like a hormone can bind to it. Some forms of dwarfism are associated with this, okay? And then, so channel, carrier, cell recognition, 
receptor. The next function is enzymatic. So let's look at an enzymatic function. There we go. Let me smala. Show us a ball. Okay, so in this case, right? So you have a membrane protein called adenylate cyclase. Now there's more to this picture. There's there's some precursor events that come into place here, but adenylate cyclase is involved in ATP metabolism. And what happens is this protein acts like an enzyme. Remember, it is an enzyme, but it's an enzyme that is embedded within the cell membrane, and that's where it's doing its job, converting one molecule to another molecule in a signal transduction pathway that we're going to look at. And this specific one, when this enzyme is not working, then it's related to cholera. And I want to show you, this was a cholera, cholera outbreak in um, 2010, and over 1,100 people died from that. And when you have cholera, this would be um, one way to explain it is, is you have extreme diarrhea and you are not able to hold fluids in your body. And the fluids that leave your body through that diarrhea are extremely contagious. So anybody that cares for you, you have a high likelihood, unless you have the most sanitary of conditions, of picking up um, that same bacteria and having the same problem occur to you. And that's why when you have these things like cholera, especially in third world countries, where they may not have the ability um, in different villages in order to have the the um, safety mechanisms in place to avoid getting it. So enzymatic proteins carry out specific metabolic functions. These are in your notes. Adenylate cyclase is an enzymatic protein that metabolizes ATP. And cholera is a bacterial disease that releases a toxin that interferes with this process. Okay, so channel, right? Carriers, cell recognition, receptors, enzymatic, and our last one we're gonna talk about are junctions, cellular junctions, okay? Now, remember, what can hold cells together if you're a plant is the cell wall. We don't have that, yet when I grab my skin, I'm not ripping off pieces of my skin. My skin cells are staying intact and staying together because of these junction proteins. Now, sometimes the protein extends from one cell all the way through to the next cell. Sometimes they um, have these big like plaques that you see right here, and instead you're having these glycoproteins that are holding it together. And this is going to affect the flexibility. Sometimes you have channels. So you have a channel in one cell that's lining up with a channel of another cell, so things can pass from one cell to another. So junction proteins join cells so that they can work together as a tissue, right? Atom, molecule, organelle, cell, tissue. So they can work together as a tissue, performing a function together, right? So, um, you're doing a great job, okay? So let me let me remind you uh, as to where we are at, okay? So we have the big picture in place. So the first thing we talked about in this video was the structure of a cell membrane, the components of the cell membrane, and how that really relates to their function, what they do, okay? So we have focused on each of those. Now, the next part I wanna talk about is remember, everything goes in and out of a cell through the cell membrane. So how does that occur? And we've touched on that just a little bit. So we're gonna talk about the permeability of a cell membrane. So taking a look at this picture right here. Okay, so you can see the phospholipid bilayer and you can see these proteins. Now, I wanna tell you what's not gonna go through this phospholipid bilayer, okay? What's not gonna go through a phospholipid bilayer is if it's large, right, because it just won't fit through, right? Remember how we talked about carbohydrates, specifically polysaccharides, and we said 
polysaccharides have two basic functions. They are either for energy storage, like glycogen and starch, right? Do you remember like that? Or we talked about structures and we talked about cellulose and we talked about chitin, right? Now we said what they have in common though, either way is they can't cross a cell membrane because they're large, right? They're too large. So here you could see some large molecule because it's so big, it cannot cross this phospholipid bilayer because it's large. The second thing, okay, that can't cross through the phospholipid bilayer between these phospholipids is if it's charged. If it's charged, it's because, right, it can't go through this hydrophobic region of the phospholipids. So if you're large or charged, okay, you're not going to cross the phospholipid bilayer. Now, if you are a small molecule, you could pass through. If you are nonpolar, you could pass through. One exception is water. Water is a small polar molecule and it can cross through the phospholipid bilayer, but we're going to see how it's assisted and moves at a much faster rate when it uses a protein, specifically what's called an aquaporin. So things that are large, either the cell membrane is going to have to go out and engulf it, like eat it, right? Like we saw when we studied um, the endomembrane system in the cell, you could go and engulf that, like and that's called endocytosis, or you're going to use a channel or a carrier to get across that cell membrane. So when you look at permeability of the plasma membrane, you want to put on there only certain molecules can pass through. Only certain molecules can pass through. In general, what can pass freely through the phospholipid? Things like gases, right? O2, CO2. So uh, and water. So what can pass freely through this phospholipid bilayer? Okay, you want to put on there water, gases, small, non-charged, usually non-polar molecules and hydrocarbons. Okay, one more time on that. Okay, what can freely pass through? Water, gases, small, non-charged, usually non-polar molecules and hydrocarbons, okay? What can't pass through without help? If you're large or charged, if you're large or charged. And if you look here, this is what's called an aquaporin. This is a protein, and I'll show you a video in class. It's a specialized protein just for water transport. Why would water need assistance? Because though it is small, right, it's oxygen and two hydrogens. You would think it could just pass right through it. It's because it's polar. It has trouble with the fatty acid region and it can't pass through that. So as a result, it needs this, what's called an aquaporin. All right, now, um, the next part on here is just about passive and active transport, which we will spend more time in in the second um, part two of this video. Okay, I need to make myself smaller. All right, but there are two, um, when you cross through, cross through a membrane, right, it can either be passive, and the definition of passive is it doesn't cost you any energy. You're just using a concentration gradient going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. That is passive transport. No energy needed by definition. Higher concentration to lower. Look, it doesn't matter how it's crossing right now. I want you to just pay attention. It's more concentrated on the outside than the inside, so therefore it's passive transport. Active transport is any time it requires energy to cross. We discussed the sodium potassium pump. That requires energy to concentrate sodium to the outside and potassium to the inside. If you use your whole cell membrane and engulf something, that's moving your whole cytoskeleton in order to grab something. That is going to be um, requiring energy. So that would be another example of active transport. Now, if you look on your notes, passive transport, the first thing you need to write on there is does not require energy, okay? It's towards a lower concentration gradient. And then let me give you some examples of that. So diffusion, by definition, diffusion is when you are taking molecules going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So you can see right here, 
These are more concentrated. Outside, this must be nonpolar, a small non-charged molecule, and it's going from this higher concentration to a lower concentration across the phospholipids. If it is charged, it may need a channel or it may need a carrier. If it's polar, it may need a channel or it may need a carrier. So when you use a protein to help you get across that phospholipid bilayer, that protein is facilitating that. And that's why it's called facilitated diffusion. Just straight up diffusion, high to low, right through, through the phospholipid bilayer, right? If you use a channel or a carrier to go from a higher concentration to a lower, it's facilitated diffusion. Now, I'm gonna add one little thing in here. This is some foreshadowing to um, part two of this video, is osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of specifically, usually water or a solvent from a higher concentration to a lower concentration across a phospholipid bilayer. And we're gonna be talking about osmosis in part two. So I gave you those um, in your notes already. Examples are diffusion and facilitated diffusion for passive transport, uses thermal slash random motion energy intrinsic to the molecule, okay? Second, active transport. Um, oh, sorry, aquaporins. Let me, sorry, I skipped over. Aquaporins are a channel protein for water molecules, and aquaporins explains why water can move so quickly across the cell membrane. Okay, active transport requires energy. Active transport requires energy, and you're moving against the concentration gradient. In this example, you are seeing these, um, what are these diamonds? Um, they are at a lower concentration outside, but yet they're getting brought to a higher concentration inside. So you're going from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. So that is not diffusion. You have to use energy in order to concentrate them to the interior. And then these um, yellow circles, what it, spheres that you have, they are at a lower concentration inside and a higher concentration outside, yet you can see they are moving, continuing to move them outside, and that would be a form of active transport. So it requires energy, you're moving against the concentration gradient, and examples would be pumps, right? Like um, the sodium potassium pump, and then endocytosis is when a cell engulfs and brings something in, and there are different types of endocytosis, and exocytosis is when a vesicle gets moved. Remember how it can walk along the microtubules? We talked about that, how it gets walked along, brought to the surface, and then expelled from the cell. That is exocytosis like exit. And we'll talk more about that also at the uh, part two. Okay. And then the last thing I want to talk about here in part one, again, how cells talk to one another, right? I said they can either touch, right? Cell to cell, or you have some sort of receptor. And so when you talk about how this message is transmitted from the exterior of the cell to the interior of the cell, you're talking about signal transduction. So for instance, if I called one of you up here on this on my phone and it sends that right out to a satellite, only one of you is gonna pick up my call when I call you because you're the one who has the receptor for the signal I just sent. So here, this is a hormone that's going throughout the entire body of this organism. But the only cells that are impacted by that hormone are the ones that have the receptor embedded here, in this case, in their cell membrane. Now notice this is a cell wall, so you're probably talking about a plant here, right? Okay, so here's the hormone. It embeds within the receptor. This receptor could also be enzymatic. It could catalyze a reaction, or it could um, trigger a series of reactions through some relay molecules, maybe some other proteins or kinases here. And that is called the transduction por portion. So it's you receive it, then you send that signal, that's the transduction. And then the third part of this is the response, whatever happens. Are you transcribing and translating some DNA? Are you activating an enzyme? That would be the response portion. And you have a highly suggested reading and thinking that focuses just on this part of it. So on your notes on how cells talk to one another, and this goes underneath the big idea number three about information storage, transmission, and response. But 
I have in your notes there about cells need to respond to signals to coordinate their cellular activities, metabolize, and better respond to a changing environment like homeostasis, right? For example, to find food, to find a mate, to develop and grow. The process of the talking, how cells talk to one another, you can have chemical messengers. That would be like if I'm dialing out on my phone and sending out that signal. You have receptor proteins, the one who receives the call after it bounces off the satellite. And then different cells have different combinations of receptors. Different cells have different combinations of receptors. And then the signal transduction pathway right here, Okay, a series of events that re and relay proteins triggered by the phone call or triggered by the receptor. And then the response is brought about by proteins. It can activate an enzyme, trigger gene expression, alter metabolism, the shape or the movement of the cell. Okay, so that ends part one of our video. So remember, we talked about the structure of the cell membrane, how it relates to the function. We spent some good time just focusing on different functions of specifically proteins. And then we talked about how things can cross the cell membrane. You can go through the phospholipid bilayer as long as you're not large or charged. If you are large or charged, you're going to have to either use a channel or a carrier or whole membrane. If you're just going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, that's going to be passive transport, no energy, right? And you might need some assistance of a protein that would be facilitated transport. You would be a pump if you're going against it, and that would be active transport, and that's the same thing for endo and exocytosis. So I know that's a lot to take in, and we'll debrief that in class. I think you're amazing and wonderful, and I hope you are having a great day.